Hello everyone, Charles Watts here. Welcome back to Inside Arsenal. I'm joined once again by James Benj of CBS, which means it is Inside Arsenal Extra Time. James, how's the week going, mate? Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. Um, apologies to all our listeners and viewers. Um, I'm a little under the weather today. So you're getting me at my croakiest um, and I will do my best though to, to mute before I sneeze or cough or whatever. It's it's all these Champions League nights to take it out of you. I was going to say, have you been Champions League out? Have you? Oh, man. I was on live blog. Rare appearance on the live blog for me for Real Madrid um, by Munich last night. And uh, yeah, that was hard. That was a hard one to write. Everyone thinks like as a, a professional, you, there's nothing you like more than dramatic late turnarounds. There's nothing I despise more than a thrilling late turnaround, particularly if it means that all your preview content for the Champions League final is now up in smokes. Even if you get to see Harry Kane virtually in tears afterwards, it's uh, it's not oh, a good thing. That was quite sweet, wasn't it? Blessed. I bet you, Gabriel. I was, all I was thinking to myself was Gabriel's probably smiling a little bit now. So now, how did that elbow work out for you in the end? Um, <laughs> yeah, what a game. What an amazing... An amazing couple of games, actually, to be honest. Um, just what is it with Madrid in that competition? It is just, they are just never say die, aren't they? I think you would, it's, it must be a mental thing almost for opposition teams. I think even when you look up at that clock and it's 88 minutes gone against them and you're winning, everything that's gone on before in previous years must run through your mind a little bit. It's like this is just not over. They're gonna, something's gonna happen, they're gonna come back. It, it must be right up there, kind of similar with United and Fergie time and all that. Mm. Like, you know, it keeps happening, keeps happening. It can't just be coincidental. I think for obviously for Madrid, you, they have that belief that they can do it. But for the opposition as well, you just got that nagging doubt in your mind each time that they're gonna they're gonna come back. There's gonna be some sort of response before full time. Hundred percent, and I think you see that with the coaches as well. I mean, there's been a lot of debate about um, who calls substitutions. I thought he took too many attackers off, but I think they all they all fear feel it and fear it, and they think siege is coming i've got to batten down the hatches and that's how tuchel responded um guardiola as well i remember when you remember when rodrigo scored two in added time to, yeah. to turn like a comfortable city win into them being out of the champions league and they just i, th I think the opposition it almost happens more to the opposition and that or the opposition first and they start freezing and madrid just realize they go right we're in this and uh yeah, it's incredible football. I, I, I'm fascinated as to how they managed to make themselves feel like underdogs against this Borussia Dortmund team at Wembley next month. But I'm sure Madrid will find a way. Yeah, yeah. The, the Tuchel thing is quite interesting, the sort of criticism coming away from the substitutions. And I get it in a way, but I always, football such fine margins, how things mm. are perceived, isn't it? Because if if Neuer doesn't drop, I can't remember, was it Bellingham? No, it was a Vinicius Benny. shot, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, if if Neuer doesn't drop that at the feet of Hoslu, or Hoslu doesn't react like he does and make the run that he does to to get the tap in, then you know Neuer just catches it again, sort of has a laugh at his mishandling, and game continues, and Bayern probably win. And Tuchel doesn't come in for the criticism he gets for taking off Kane. It's such fine margins how how decisions and and, and everything's perceived. I think. And, um, but yeah, I did think it was quite funny. I have to say, seeing Kane off the pitch, having to watch that, <laughs> it kind of reminded me of Lota Mateus in nineteen ninety nine when. Uh, he was oh, off the yeah. pitch for, for Bayern against Man United and the camera just kept zooming to him every <laughs> as the goals went in and he could do nothing about it. It was, uh, yeah, it was very, very dramatic. I have to say, I've been watching them thinking, oh, if only Arsenal got through against Bayern, because obviously Madrid do what they do, but I still I still don't think they're unbeatable from Arsenal in that in that second, in that semi-final. Obviously, I think they probably would have found a way to win the extra now, sort of gotten through, but I'd have loved to have seen Arsenal go up against them in over two legs. It would have been, it would have been <laughs> fascinating, fascinating to watch. Just imagine that dagger though in the back of your in the back of the Arsenal team, and then they have to go to Old Trafford. I mean, yeah. that would be a challenge. That would be a challenge. That would. Be, I still would have liked to have. I would have liked to have seen it. Obviously, we're going to talk about that United game. Huge game now. What are we Thursday? Early afternoon, just over forty-eight hours away from that uh, that game at Old Trafford, and. By the way, everyone, myself and James have just learned that neither of us have got to go into the game. We haven't got our press accreditation for it because the um, Old Trafford press box is very, very small. And see, I'm I'm work for goal at the moment for on a match day, and goals Manchester based guy has got in, and I'm not. And while that is a little bit disappointing, maybe it is actually very, very good news because neither of us combined have ever seen Arsenal win at Old Trafford while we've been there. So. 
the fact that we're not going to be there is probably a pretty good thing for Arsenal's hopes of maintaining this t- title charge and keeping their title hopes alive until the final weekend of the season. So we are going to talk about that. We've got lots of questions from you guys. You've been sending it in very, very quickly because I flagged it in this morning's show and lots of you have been getting questions in already. Uh, we're going to talk about the Premier League Player of the Year nominations, which are certainly sparking a little mm-hmm. bit. Um, and some other stuff as well. So we'll get cracking. And we'll start, shall we, with with Old Trafford, as that is just a couple of days away now. Arsenal versus Manchester United. Um, Arteta versus Ten Hag. Two clubs, shall we say, tracking on very different trajectories right now. I mean, all signs point to a comfortable Arsenal win, don't they, James? What could don't possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong at Old Trafford? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> just that you, you're right I cannot you know, if this was any team other than Manchester United in the form they're in playing the football that they do this sort of how big can we make the pitch for the opposition how much space can we give them to attack I'd be saying Arsenal should be going into this game not just thinking about the win but thinking about that goal difference again and really building the gap on City but it's it's Old Trafford and you know, I, I don't think any more, and I, I remember the night very well, but I don't think any more about Will Tord and Vieira and that game. You think about everything else, all the other times that Arsenal have gone, and you've kind of gone there with a bit of belief, and it's been crushed, whether it's by sort of total randomness, you know, like that 3-2 win when Ronaldo scored twice, or an off day, or experience from United shining through. Now, they've got none of this. This is, you know, this is the worst United team I've seen in my life. Um, I think it's worse than Moy's team. I think it's worse than the team Ten Hag inherited. It's a mess. Uh, it looks like it will be pretty short on options as well. Maybe Lissandro Martinez comes in, but I wouldn't be afraid of him. You know, I mean, if nothing else, I can't see him winning an aerial duel with Kai Havertz. But it's, it's Old Trafford, isn't it? And I mean, that hoodoo definitely has a hold over the fans. Does it over the players? Like, I don't know, I'll ask you that question because I I don't feel like I don't know the answer to it, but a lot of them have not won there. And even those that have not necessarily won an an Old Trafford that's baying for for Arsenal blood, have they? No, absolutely. It certainly holds fear of me. Uh, There's no ground that I'm walking up to more that fills me with dread more than Old Trafford. I just get the same sinking feeling every time I'm walking through the car park towards the stadium it just it's the same every year it's just been misery after misery and that must that must go into players heads and must go into even coaching staff's heads I suppose I mean Arsenal have won there we've got to flag that fairly recently they'll see the COVID season and Bamiyang's penalty mm. the 1-0 um, so they have won there albeit a very different Arsenal team than the one now the one thing I you know the the sort of thing I hold quite strongly going into this one though it's this is a very different arsenal team the mentality is different the players are different the beliefs different and you know they i cannot imagine they're going to be thinking too much about previous disappointments like even last season you know i thought arsenal was the best i've seen arsenal play at old trafford in a long long time they were the better team on that day by it was quite a distance but they sh- they were sh- showed a bit of naivety that i don't think they would show this time around in, ter- in terms of how they got picked apart in that 3-2 last season I don't see that happening this time around. They're smarter than that. They're cleverer than that. Um, and I also don't think Man United are going to be as dangerous as they were on that day. Um, I didn't realise Martinez could be back. I hadn't looked at that. Is that is that a chance he's going to be back? An outside, an outside chance, yeah. I think he's obviously got a real eye on the FA Cup final because it's the last big game United have. But, I mean, whether he might also be around the squad, that's sort of mm-hmm. what, you know, a bit. I've done some digging, but also, you know, let's be honest. The Manchester reporters know better than me, and I, I've seen that. I've seen that suggested. But you know, like you say, even Martinez, who would be a great boost for United to have back, even at, at half fitness, and that tells you everything about where United are. You know, you've, if you play the players, not the badge, you should be so incredibly confident about what's to come. You know, I mean. Trossard or I mean probably Trossard but perhaps Martinelli going up against Wamba Saka Dalot who I think's had a good season on the opposite flank though he's going to struggle with Saka you know across the pitch you, you think Arsenal can win their individual duels here quite handily but like you say I mean it's I know that Arsenal I, I I think the thing that you would say about this Arsenal team is 
they rise to the moment. They remember as well the times that things have gone wrong for them. They they can turn that sense of being aggrieved, of feeling robbed, like you know they were robbed a goal at, uh, at Old Trafford. Whether they were robbed to win, they were certainly robbed a, a fair goal, as PGMOL admitted at the time. Same referee, in charge, are, same referee in charge this weekend it, that was in charge for that game. That I mean, it was. Right. I suppose that wasn't the referee's fault. Either. It was, it was VAR. Referee, I suppose, think yeah. it was VAR and. The the old VAR era, we've had about 10 of them, where um, they get much too involved in proceedings and uh, I, that would never stand this season, I don't think. No. But I, th I think Arsenal are so good at turning that into fuel for the fire. You know, when they when West Ham beat them earlier in the season, their response was to go and bully them at their own stadium. Um, I can't think of any, any more examples, but I know there are loads. Uh, you know, the way they've treated Brighton as well ever since that 3-0 loss. Um, so I do have faith in them. And I think a lot of this, it's just uh, people that have followed Arsenal for a long time have these problems, have these hang-ups, and they should like you shouldn't have it about this team because Arsenal is so much better. Well, there is Arsenal's recent record in the last 16 matches at Old Trafford on the screen now. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see that. So it's one win, and that was that 1-0 win from Aubameyang's penalty in 2020-2021 season. Other than that, it's been, what, one, two, three, four draws, one win, 11 defeats including Welbs erasure in there though isn't there yeah there's no FA Cup obviously that's the Premier League we're talking about here um so it's not been great but obviously Arteta's not been in charge for for all of those but they're gonna have to they're gonna have to sort that record out if they want to maintain this title challenge because if Arsenal lose at Old Trafford obviously it's pretty much going to be done you would think by the time the last weekend comes around um well it could be done if Man City unless Unless don't even say unless Tottenham do anything against Matt. Oh, I'm thinking Fulham. I'm all oh, in on Fulham. Fulham. Fulham is if it's. I said this earlier. If it's going to happen this season for Arsenal in terms of Man City, it's going to happen at Fulham because there is. I would bet my house on the fact that Tottenham and West Ham are going to get nothing. You couldn't pick if you're Man City, unless apart from Sheffield United, maybe oh. you literally couldn't hand pick your final two opponents better than Tottenham. And West Ham, you just couldn't. You, so you don't think that West Ham are, are desperate to give David Moyes a, a win on his last last yeah, game? I'm sure, I'm sure they're going to be absolutely desperate for that. I'm sure that's <laughs> going to be at the forefront of their mind um, before they swan off on holiday on the final day of the season to give David Moyes one big uh, last hurrah at the Etihad. Absolutely no, provided unless you know Rodri and Harlan get into a fight between themselves and both get sent off in the first minute or something like that and City go down <laughs> to nine men because I'd back City to beat them with 10 men I think they'd have to go yeah, down yeah. to nine men before I'd start to think it's a... and then I think even then you're only hoping for a point aren't you yeah it'd it's be square. close no no so yeah I think yeah Fulham's going to be obviously key but Arsenal have got to get the job done first and they're, they're going second this um this weekend the last couple of weekends they've been obviously going first and setting the tone Man City have handled it pretty well and responded very well with the wins against Forest and um did they beat the other day? Wolves, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so they responded well. So it's, it's kind of flipped on its head this time around and Man City again first. Do you think that will have any sort of impact on how Arsenal handle it on, on Sunday at Old Trafford? Yeah, I, I because we, we think you know uh, City will win, I do think it will sort of up the stakes and make it more of a challenge because, I, don't, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Arsenal can't even afford to draw. If they draw, they may not be able to take it to the final day. They'd be reliant on Spurs. Is that right? I don't know. I will have to have you. Have to have a look. <laughs> you while you work that out, I'll keep. I'll keep vamping. I. I, I mean, it, it's. It, I think, of course, it adds a scintilla of extra pressure. It just becomes a little bit harder when you know. Yeah, you draw, have to Sorry, win. interrupting you. Draw is not enough. They've got to win because if they draw, they'll be on eighty-four points. City win the next two games, they move to eighty-eight. So there'll be four points head going into the final day. Yeah. So, I mean, look. You know, keep saying it. They should win. They're good enough to win. Um, but it, it would be harder. Equally, I think it would actually almost get whatever the circumstances, it would be harder. If Willian delivers a brilliant ball to the back post, Alex Awobi tucks it in and it's one all at, the, at Craven Cottage, I think then the pressure becomes right. It's really in your hands now. And, you know, no one would say it's sort of Arsenal won the league at Old Trafford, but it would it would sort of take on this historical resonance, wouldn't it? It would be the, the weekend that the title swung Arsenal's way. And that would be hard as well. Um, I think it's always a bit easier, isn't it, to set the set the bar. And if you want to leap over that bar, like, what can you do? But, um, yeah, you would rather go. I mean, maybe disagree with me if you think I'm wrong, but I, I would always rather go first.
No, I agree with you. It's like a penalty shootout. I'd always want to go first in a penalty shootout. And uh, I, I think it's exactly the same on this one. Get the job done yourselves rather than having that pressure. You think back to last season, wasn't it, when um, when City went and, and won at Everton and then you had the Brighton game straight afterwards and mm. the, the, the impact that that win clearly had on Arsenal, I think, and certainly the fans as well. Just the whole day, it was uh, you could really feel it in that one. So, um, yeah, I'd rather go. I'd rather go. Um, I'd rather go first, but we shall see. It's going to be a, it's going to be another big day. Just looking at the start. This was a starting eleven on the screen that started against Bournemouth. It was also the starting eleven that started against Spurs. Of course, there's been no changes yet. Do you see any way that Mikel changes that starting lineup for Sunday? I don't think he does. I think it's going to stay, barring barring any sort of injury that we don't know about that's happened in training. Um, and it, yesterday down at the training ground, everyone was fit. There was no, there was no play. Oh, Tommy Asu wasn't there, wasn't he? But the, the word was that he was just training inside and it's no, nothing that can rule him out of the game at the weekend. So, yeah, barring any injuries, I don't see any changes. What about you? No, wouldn't dream of it. Arsenal are in the I, green. I had a question on a show earlier on uh, this week saying, as good as party's been, when he plays the game sometimes turns a little bit basketball like because of the mm-hmm. you know the the risk he takes with the passes and the turnovers that can come from that and do you think this would possibly a game for Jorginho which I could understand the question but then I also thought the way United play and how easy they are to play through if you've got someone basketball. like you've got someone like Thomas who can just suddenly split that line which is so easy to split in the United team and get the ball to Odegaard in space or Saka in space and stuff like that I think you have it you go with party all day long for this one yeah, I mean, I do think that's an interesting point because, you know, he will be the one getting hit by Bruno Fernandes in the press. And when Fernandes is, when the mood takes Fernandes and if Partey does dawdle a bit, it can be more high risk. Maybe there's also an argument that it's just like, look, you don't need a line breaker against United. United break their own lines for you. Uh, so, I mean, put it this way, if it was sort of 1-0 to Arsenal in the 60th minute, I'd be sort of staring over at Jorginho respectfully and and thinking, do you fancy popping in for this? But I think I thought uh, against Bournemouth in particular, he was a little bit, and that was a, that's a good pressing team. He, he looked like he'd got into the rhythm a bit more. Um, and I think maybe he's sort of entitled to the view of like, these games became a bit basketball-y. He lost possession a lot because he was just getting that Premier League rhythm into his legs. And it, it seems like the last two, three games he's he's got there. Yeah, I think he's been good against Spurs and, and against Bournemouth. I thought Arsenal were really, really good against Bournemouth. I thought it was a really good, decent performance, like you said, against a team who who were playing very, very well and arrived in in good form. And the first half, especially, I thought Arsenal were fantastic. And it was the fact it was only one nil was you know down to some poor finishing, but also some very, very good defending from from Bournemouth, who went against the narrative of teams being on the beach at the end of the season the way they were throwing themselves into blocks <laughs> minute after minute it felt like they'd done about 20 blocks in the first 10 minutes of that game it was incredible watching them I turned to my dad and I was just like this lot is supposed to have nothing to play for what are they doing can't they just let one of these go in um uh but yeah I thought it was, on the whole I thought it was a good Arsenal performance under quite a bit of pressure I love I, I love Bournemouth as well side note I mean as looking down that list of players Zabani in particular I was like oh Smart teams should be um, knocking on their door and seeing what they can get for some of that for some of that squad as well. So Lanky looked really good up for the, like you say, up for the fight. I think that's sort of, you can tell it's a team that work hard for their manager and all due respect to Sudden Day's opponents. I don't think I've seen that from Manchester United all season long. No, I mean, they were shambolic against Crystal Palace. Palace were good, but they were absolutely shambolic. Just some of the... Some of the defending, Casemiro. I mean, oh my God, it was it was so so bad. I mean, when you look at this Arsenal team, then if if we're going to go with the same side, I mean, I don't really see there's any question marks. If there's a doubt over Tommy Asu, obviously injury wise, maybe that changes things. Um, I presume you'd go Kivior probably rather than Zinchenko yeah, if Tommy Asu yeah. does go out is is injured and. You know, where, where else is there any sort of question mark? It's not even really a question mark on the left-hand side of the attack anymore at the moment. It's just Trossard over Martinelli, isn't it? I didn't think Trossard was particularly brilliant against Bournemouth, but I thought he was good. And obviously, he popped up with the crucial second goal. And, you know, you get a chance like that at Old Trafford. I don't think there's anyone else in this Arsenal team right now you want it to fall to rather than Leandro Trossard. So I just, yeah, like we were saying, I don't see any changes in that side. I mean, where do you see Arsenal's strength being if they do line up like this? You know, where, how do you see them really hurting Man United? I mean, above all else, in the in that midfield engine room, 
whether Casemiro is playing there or playing at centre back, Arsenal are going to dominate there. They have sort of technical, physical superiority over anyone they might run into there. You know, you see guys like Christian Eriksen just looking utterly bereft and looking old and slow legged. I'm really intrigued as to how United would deal with with Havertz and how you utilise Havertz. Um, I mean, it obviously sort of depends on the centre-backs you face, but let's assume it's Evans and Casemiro. As as good as, as Kai is in the air and as good as he is at someone that breaks the lines, I wonder if there he begins to function as more of that sort of false nine, dropping deep and sort of challenging Casemiro and Evans, who are not going to want to move up the pitch, not going to want to leave those angles for Saka, Trossard, Erdegaard to run into. So um, I think this is going to be a... A really intriguing game. It's so funny. I know we almost every week we talk about Kai Havertz because he's such a wonderful enigma of a player. And I feel like now we're seeing the the good headaches that he brings to you, where it's sort of like, do you want him to be your target man to win the duels, to get the knockdowns? Or on an occasion like this, can he almost be another 10 and you sort of function like that and you have Erdegaard? Havertz kind of playing quite similar height wise and you use Saka and Trossard cutting in on their strongest feet and trying to bend the ball in it's it's options it's what I think is so good about Havertz at the moment I love that he gives them that it's brilliant yeah yeah he's been fantastic superb against against Bournemouth up for player of the month isn't he for April um for the Premier League is that be it's not been given out yet is it or has it have tomorrow I morning that? normally it is. is it tomorrow, tomorrow morning? Friday morning yeah I mean there can't be I suppose who else is in there Cole Palmer is he up for that <laughs> Takes well, a lot of penalties, Chief. Yeah, so I'm sure he'll be in the running. But yeah, Havertz been absolutely fantastic. Right, let's move on. I just want to talk to you about, I spoke about this in my show this morning. Obviously, Simon Collins over at Standard ran a story today um, listing Wojciech Szczesny as a potential option for Arsenal this summer as they look as look at replacements for Ramsdale, who we you know expect to go one way or the other this summer. And um, Szczesny was listed on there um, still. I think Brighton was there as well. I mean, how... how I think the goalkeeper situation is going to be really, really intriguing at Arsenal in the, in the window this summer. What they do, you know, how, what sort of direction they go down when they go for the number two. You think of the last couple of that Arsenal have had. Obviously, this year has been a bit of a, it's just been a really strange one with the whole Ramsdale riot thing. Last season, we obviously had um, uh, Matt Turner, almost forgot his name, who <laughs> was very okay. much the number two. But, you know, that lasted one year because any goalkeeper sort of, fairly young with international ambitions you can sit around for a year or so not not playing but then obviously get a little bit of itchy feet even if they're big Arsenal fans like Matt Turner was and wants to go out and play to protect his international status so what sort of direction do you see Arsenal going down and what did you think when you saw the the link to Chesney who is actually a goalkeeper that we've spoken about on this channel was kind of ticking the boxes in some ways um but then also not like I've had a couple of questions on for this actually um, one from Robin, one from, uh, what's that, Binge Home, is that? Um, says what? So Robin says, why do you think Chesney is a good fit when he doesn't play with his feet well uh, or, or that well? Or at least to level Arteta would want to ensure that we can play the same way. Uh, and then Binge, I, am I getting that right or am I misreading that? Is that looks right to me. Binge Home, yeah, it says, hi, Charles James. Do you think Arteta, who rates discipline amongst his players so highly, would be okay bringing <laughs> back Chesney, who was kicked out of the club for essentially smoking in the shower at the club? It wasn't at the club, it was actually at St Mary's. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> do you think when you look at the name Chesney and what he could bring, to Arsenal and how he plays his football. Do you see him as a good fit? I think maybe I'm letting my heart rule my head a little bit of it because I think, oh, that's a good option. Good age, knows the club, likes the club, might be happy to wind down his career as number two and it won't. you won't quite have that dy dynamic of two top goalkeepers fighting out for the number one spot. But then I suppose Arsenal were burnt a little bit by Matt Turner, who, whilst he is a decent shot stopper, cannot play with a ball at his feet. And that is so essential to this Arsenal team. And ultimately, when he did come into the side, it was very, very apparent that he didn't quite fit the bill in terms of what Arteta wants. I, I suppose the, the the playing with the ball at his feet, I, I have more questions than like feeling like I know the answer to that. He plays in Serie A for a coach who is not the most progressive uh, in Max Allegri. I don't think Juventus are a team that is particularly effective at, at the sort of building from the back and kind of my memory from Chesney a long time ago is I never thought it was a great problem of his with the ball at his feet and I certainly remember seeing him at Roma and he looked stronger so how much of it is tactical 
I don't know. The discipline thing, I, I feel like I can pretty much park that because there have been no complaints from his time at Juventus. I remember when he was at Roma speaking to people there and they raved about him and, you know, there was a sense that he'd grown up. You know, yeah. the guy was, he was a very, He was very young at Arsenal, wasn't he? Yeah. And thrown into the limelight very early as well. So it's not surprising there was a few disciplinary slips. Yeah. But yeah, I don't think that's too much of an issue now. I, I, I think the issue with Chesney per se is I don't know if he would be ready for the role we're talking about. He's only just turned 34. Mm. Um, you know, that means you're talking potentially, I mean, obviously this summer's Euros and then the World Cup to follow. None of that would be beyond a goalkeeper of his age. So is would he be ready? I'd love to see him back one day. And if I think if he's ready to to make the move he ticks a lot of boxes i think it's very helpful to have a backup goalkeeper who is a homegrown player yeah. so that takes you know the need to find someone to fill one of those spots elsewhere in a more important position out um i mean the other name i throw into the mix because i i do know arsenal have been tracking him i don't know i, I think the challenge is he may well come with quite a high transfer fee uh, is anthony patterson at sunderland again ticks a lot of those boxes but but with that you would be signing a goalkeeper that even if you bought him to be back up and he was prepared to do that, it would be a Turner sort of style situation where he wouldn't want to be back up for his whole career. Yeah. So I think if you could sell someone like Chesney on being a really reliable number two for three, four years so that you don't have to keep spending money on wages, signing on fees, transfers, I think he'd be perfect. Mm. It's a really interesting one. You know, there's lots of talk on what Arsenal are going to do in the summer isn't there and the focus on the forwards and midfielders defenders but what they do at goalkeeper is actually it's a really important decision that they have to get right really because they've chopped and changed it's been kind of groundhog day with the goalkeepers for a couple of summers now you don't want to be doing that every single year so you kind of need to get it right because second choice is still a really important part of the squad for arsenal and um yeah it's it's interesting there's not been too much focus on it but it's a really key decision i think they do need to get right this because they just don't want to be in this position 12 months down the line again thinking about what are we going to do with the goalkeepers but also the fact that they've also it's going to come in the summer where they're going to be spending 27 million on their first choice keeper as well so it's not just signing yeah. one goalkeeper although obviously Raya is you know we all kind of consider him an Arsenal player at the moment of course technically he's not and so they are going to have to complete that deal which they will but then you're going to have to spend more money on a second choice goalkeeper there's a lot of money in one in one summer window spent on goalkeepers that they're going to have to invest. I mean, Aaron Ramsdale's fee, you would kind of be confident would cover Ramsdale and a cheap backup. And obviously, you know. If they get a fee for Aaron Ramsdale. <laughs> I'm, well, sure. no, no, I'm, not, I'm not saying they're getting even when I'm free, but, you know. <laughs> it's does it, Is there going to be, how big a market is there going to be for Aaron Ramsdale? Especially when clubs know that Arsenal are in a position where they need to get him off the books. You know, is it going to it's always going to the be challenge, a, late, isn't it, of... a late loan deal after the Euros or something like that? Obviously, I hope it's not, but... Is it, we all think it's a foregone conclusion that they're going to sell Aaron Ramsdale, but is it, is there going to be that bigger market? Is it going to be that easier deal to get done? I mean, hopefully, but I don't know. It's a really good point because I think with Petrovic sort of establishing himself at Chelsea, who are hardly going to be cash rich anyway, you know, the number of clubs that Ramsdale would also look at and say, you know, I, I don't know what his mind his view on it is but i also know that there were opportunities to go in january that he wasn't particularly sold on because he you know he knows this is the big move of his career now and he's got to find somewhere that he's going to be number one for three four five years hmm. so yeah i hadn't necessarily thought of that as much but it's it's I quite know, a small New, newcastle are definitely in the running for ramsdale they definitely that's something that's definitely been discussed but Again, I don't know if that's a, I don't know what sort of deal that would potentially be. I don't know what if that depends on if Nick Pope leaves or, or what. But I know Newcastle definitely, there's definitely been discussions about Ramsdale with Newcastle. So I think that's one to keep an eye on as a possible destination. But well, well yeah, Dougie, Dougie Freeman, if you're watching this, he's rated very highly. I'd say, I mean, I, I would say 10 million in Isaac is a fair deal. Yeah, absolutely. For him, Bruno as well. I think that's a definitely a fair deal for that one. Right, let's talk about player of the season nominations. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because, quite frankly, they're bollocks. But um, <laughs> I just I have found it quite funny that I I kind of glossed over when I saw the player of the season award, and I, the first thing I thought was how on earth is Virgil Van Dijk in that? 
and not a mm. single defender from comfortably the best defence in the Premier League in that list, you know. And I think Van Dijk's had a really good season and he's looked almost back to his best this year after, you know, a pretty disappointing season last time out. So I'm not having a go at Virgil van Dijk by any means. But I just think, where is the thought process? How does Virgil get in ahead of, you know, if you put in Virgil van Dijk, how are you not putting Saliba and Gabriel in there? And then, you know, what about Ben White as well, who has just been so exceptional at both ends of the pitch? Uh, I just, I just, yeah, it made me laugh. I just thought, how on earth is that possible? And then I noticed that Rodri wasn't even in there, which I thought was the was the funniest thing of the lot. It's like, how on earth is Haaland up for the Player of the Season award and Rodri is not? I mean, that is so just mind blowing. I'd love to know how this has all worked out and decided. It has the look of uh, a Player of the Season where someone sort of came into the Premier League offices at nine o'clock this morning and said, guys, you know we're announcing the uh, Premier League Player of the Season nominees in half an hour. And then someone's like, oh, Christ, we've got to... And then they just go, they, they hit publish and they go, oh, my God, we forgot Rodri. Yeah. And, oh, my God. <laughs> exactly that. Why is there only eight players nominated for this? Like, there are quite a lot of good players in the Premier League. I agree with you on Van Dijk as well. I mean, he is not the player he was. He's been good, really good this season. I, it feels a little bit like you're like, well... You know, Liverpool were in this title race for, for 30 games, 35 games, however long you want to call it. Like, there's got to be a Liverpool player in yeah. there. It's exactly what it feels like. like. We've uh, got to get a token Liverpool player in there, definitely. We can't just, we can't have no Liverpool player in it. It's, it's, it's stupid. And I mean, look at that young player of the season award. It's just, I, I'll be honest, I don't, you know, I think that the whole young player thing is a total mess because it is. How well Erling Haaland's 23, but it's also just like they've just been around him, Foden, even I would say Saka. Saka, yeah, it's the same. Around forever. Isak, Alexander Isak for the player of the young players. It's just players, it's like there, there's got to be a different sort of, I don't know, the criteria's got to change, surely, for that. You've got to be 21 or under or, or something um, and have not played two full seasons in the Premier League, something like that to be considered mm. for a young player of the season. It's just that that list just hilariously bad. It's it. really harsh on someone like um well I mean I, I know we're not going to get much sympathy from our viewers but like Destiny of Doggies come in from Italy had a really nice encouraging seat the sort that you kind of want to make sure there's an award to celebrate um you know like we would have said this about Saliba last season I don't think he even got close to young player of the season last season because you had to give it to Haaland and I know Haaland was new then but you end up with this sort of weird scenario where you don't, you just end up celebrating about three players over and over again. Um, yeah. Oh, it, it makes it all really boring. Like yeah. I, I follow a lot of American sports and they're, they're so good at building these things up to be big things. There's a, you know, not just the first team of the year, PFA team of the year thing, but there's a second and third, which I think would be a great idea for celebrating the Anthony Robinsons of the world. Um, you know, Kai Havertz wouldn't be on like the first team, the first PFA Premier League team of the year, would it? You'd have to have a Haaland, Isaac, someone like that. But he obviously deserves some sort of award for his improvements throughout the season and how good he's been. Um, it's just Kai, oh, Havertz, yeah, Kai, Havertz should get the, Kai Havertz should get the shutting everyone up award. Yes. Like that. And, and that should be aimed at me and you, especially. Um, but a lot of other people. I remember, do you remember the Athletic did a poll with their writers at the end of the transfer window and who was the work what was the worst deal with the transfer window and i think havertz got like 10 votes and the person who came second got two votes so you know it was so it was just everyone voted havertz as the worst deal with the premier league and he's just but shut like, so many people up with what he's done but i don't i don't even i mean like 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 you say including us because i don't know if i'd have picked him as the worst deal of the season um i'd have probably said like someone like Roma, romeo lavia like I didn't think it was a good deal. Like, I still think you could have got him from Chelsea for a lot less than you ended up paying them. I just think in the end, now sixty million seems a fair price. But um, yeah, the, I mean the whole. The whole I, I would love to go back to everyone's um, my predictions in particular and see how badly I got things wrong. But uh, luckily, Twitter's there to do that for me. Yeah, I was going to go back the other day. Do you remember? A, it must have been a few months ago. Now we laid out every single Arsenal fixture remaining, and we, oh, yeah. and we predicted what what those results were going to be. And I can't remember what episode we did it in, but I'd love to go back and watch that and see how right or wrong. I don't think we'd have been that far off because I think we basically predicted Arsenal to win most games. Win every game. I think. Um, I I think mean, I'm I'm pretty I, sure. I, we had them topping out at around 88 
89 yeah. points. We're not, which I don't is think we would, have been, we would have been far off. I think I had us down to lose at City and then maybe draw at Spurs or something like that, but then win most other ones. I'm not sure, but um, I don't think it would be far off. So out of these ridiculous lists, who would you be choosing out of those eight to be player of the season and who would you be choosing to be young player of the season out of those those nominees? Um, I would go Rice, player of the season. I think he was robbed by the football writers. Uh, and Cole Palmer for young player of the season. I oh, think he's go. just he's just he's the right, like he's the, the the sort of person that should win that award, isn't he? Young player yeah. taking the average the exact, one's they're back. the exact two that I would go for as well. I think Rice I don't I don't I don't mind the fact that Foden won the FWA award. I wouldn't have voted for him myself, but I can understand why others did. And you know, I don't think it's a disgrace that he got that award, even though I'd have gotten down another route. Um, I don't think it's a disgrace, but I do think Rice's candidacy is a lot better. Yeah. Yeah, no, so do I. Absolutely, I do. Um, but I still I wasn't surprised that Foden got it. But yeah, out of those two, in those two in front of me, I'd have Rice player of the season. Uh and yeah, definitely Cole Palmer as young player of the season. Right. I'm gonna move on to some questions and comments now. I'm not we're not gonna do this now. I just wanted to bring this up to say to Aurora Freak, it's been noted. I think at the end, the week after the the title has been won by Arsenal, uh, yeah. I think that we uh, we're going to do a show based on this question. Okay, this will be our this will be our first show of the summer window. Okay, so we're not going to answer this now, Aurora Freak, but thank you for sending it in from Switzerland. Um, I'm going to park it, and mm. myself and James will discuss it a lot more in depth when we've had time to sort of work out what we want to say from it and i think it's a really good basis for an actual show at the start of the summer transfer window so we will move on to this thank you very much for your uh, your question okay here's one from ben he says afternoon guys who do you think is the best young talent in world football right now let's say under 21s for the sake of the argument i personally love zaire emery from psg i think his ceiling is so high so there you go james answer that one we're, we're treating under 21s in the same way they're treated at international level right um so 21 if you're 21 you yeah, 21 and under. You can cool. be 21. Easy. Yeah. Easy. Easy peasy. Uh, we're actually just going to pre-trail this. I think I'm allowed to do that. We will have a, something dropping on CBS at, at the end of the season uh, of the best players in the world, which has really helped me go and work out who I think the best player 21 and under is. Although, wait a minute. Now I've just had a thought. So why would we get it? No, oh, no. Uh, well, the answer is clearly Jude Bellingham. <laughs> See, I've got Jude. I've, I've written a few of these down. I'm, and I've got Bellingham However, number one, but I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to list in our argument like we were talking about the Young Player of the Year award. I don't want to put Bellingham in this because he's just, he, although he's that age, I just consider him above that now. If you see what I mean, so uh, I, I'm well, that's taking... the challenge I had with my with my other choice as well, which okay. was Florian Wirtz. Uh, see, I've got Florian Wirtz in there as well. He's uh, he's he's right there with Bellingham. I, I think he might he might be the sort of he can fit that young talent thing. Because people talk about Bellingham, rightly like so, as being in the mix for Ballon d'Or. I think maybe Vinicius is going to get it now. Um, but no one sort of says that Vert's the best player in a team that may well do a full invincible season. No one talks about him in that mix. He is magnificent. I mean, if the chance ever comes, maybe in the Champions League next season, but whenever, to get yourself out to Leverkusen and see this guy in the flesh, he is this magical amalgam of every talented creator you've seen in the last decade or so you know there's Erdegaard's work rate off the ball there's that eye for a pass like Ozil positioning sense of a Modric he's not that at that level yet but also his trajectory says he could eclipse all of them mm -hmm. I think he is world class already um, and yeah. people do not talk about him enough because no one watches the Bundesliga is he an out-and-out -out starter for Germany now? Is he he's starting every game for, for the national team? That's a good question. I suppose with Nagelsmann changing things up, I don't know for certain, but I would assume he will be. I, yeah. You would you would think come the Euros. It could be a huge breakout summer for him, really. At the end of this season that he's had for Leverkusen and then the home Euros in the form of, that he's showing now, you know, he could he could absolutely move into the new stratosphere with a, with a good mm. summer tournament, couldn't he? Oh, yeah. And I, I, I think before long, it, the question will become whether he's going to land at Madrid, 
Barcelona, City, City. who I, I bet will be where he lands. Um, yeah. uh, left eight, Florian, left eight. Be nice. Granite, have a word. Agent Granite. Well, what about, what about you? Are you trying to sneak Well, I've got here? Bellingham and Verts in there. I've got Musiala as well, who just about still qualified mm. as a 21 year old Gavi or Javi Gavi um that's the only 19 but Lamin Yamal as well you know I mean we talk when you're talking about proper young you know 17 type year old players he just looks unbelievable at times for what he's doing the amount of games he's playing at his age 17 years old that's like um uh oh my god how have I, honestly my memory is so bad as i'm getting older i mean it's, uh, it's, it's, it's ethan ranieri it's, it's like ethan ranieri playing every yeah. single game now for arsenal at that age you know that's what he's doing and he's producing at the top level you know in in the league or in champions league as well so yeah he he absolutely has to be as, up there as well so yeah i think any give or take any of those five and and they're right up there but florin verts from what i've seen of him and i haven't had the chance to see him you know up close and personal like you have but he just looks like a brilliant talent. I think it's a fantastic story as well, coming back from such a serious injury at his yeah. age as well. When you know, there's so many doubts about whether you can come back and and find your best form again, and you know he's done that and just looks like he's never been away. So, yeah, thanks for your question there, Ben. Here's one from Dave from Ottawa who says, "I know Paulinho at Fulham is getting a little old in comparison to our young squad, but I think he'd be a great fit for us to bolster our DM in an event party is injured or gone. Or do you think we should be looking for a player with more miles in front?" Them behind in any case here is hoping he has a performance for the ages on Saturday yeah absolutely now I know you're not the biggest Jao Paulinho fan we've talked about this before haven't we you I think you think he's a decent player but you don't think he's someone yeah. that Arsenal should be going for now I, I like Paulinho and I said not long ago that I kind of if I was picking anyone to come in and improve this Arsenal team he would be right up there um I think I've moved on a little bit from that now and I kind of feel like as you say Dave that maybe looking for the how many miles have you got in front of you rather than behind you? I think I'd be going more down that route when it comes to the, the Arsenal midfield. And I also think, and obviously Paulina would fit into this as well, but for most of this season, I've been thinking Arsenal need new number, uh, new number eight, that left eight role. Havertz hasn't quite done it there. For my mind, I, I wouldn't have any complaints. Havertz being the starting number nine for Arsenal next season, given the way he's playing and what he's bringing to the team. Mm. But I also want to see, I, I think Declan Rice is, is going to be an unbelievable number eight the more i see from declan rice now the more i don't really want to see him as an as a six i want to see him in that eight i think he's got so much to give in that position he's just going to get better and better from it as well i think arsenal should be going all out for a number six this summer um and obviously paulinho could fit that role but i think bruno is a is a good shout i'm not i i like the bruno Guimaraes links i don't like the mm. price but i like the links and what he could potentially add to this team yeah, I, I agree with a, a lot of what you said there. It's also just, I mean, pa Palinia is fantastic at winning the ball back. Um, I don't, especially in front of his own penalty area, but like, also don't need that, do they? Like, it, it just wouldn't be someone that would fit with their needs. Like you, Bruno Guimaraes is someone that would really interest me for the six. I think if anything ever looks up with Barcelona's finances, you pick up the phone and you just say, how can we make something work for Frankie de Jong? And I know he's on a lot of money, but Frankie de Jong is um, the gold standard of, of the sort of midfielder I think Arsenal need. And that six position, someone that could equally like, you know, even within games, he could be the eight and Rice can be the six and vice versa. Yeah. And it could be a double pivot. It can be anything you need it to be. Um, yeah, it's when you're as good as Arsenal are, it's the old Guardiola quote, isn't it? Why why coach tackles? Why play for tackles? Um, Palinia would just have nothing to do. It'd be lovely to have someone to bring on in the 85th minute when you're 1 0 up in a Champions League game. Um, but yeah, I, I love him at Fulham as well. It's just a good fit. Yeah. And as Dave says, he's hoping for a generational performance from him. <laughs> We're all behind <laughs> you. At the weekend. Uh, here's one from Brian Kennedy. He says, any news on the new contract for Amore Cozy or Dubri? Cheers. Well, I mean, this will be answered pretty quickly. No new news, really. It's still the same mm -hmm. as it was. Club talking, club hoping that he will sign a new contract, but it's not been signed. And there's plenty of other clubs who are doing their very best to get him out of Arsenal. And um, so, yeah, that's something that's going to be decided in the next couple of months. But in terms of any news on a new contract, it hasn't really moved on from where we were a couple of months ago. Unless you know something I don't there, uh, James? I I'm, I'm I'm hearing exactly the same. 
um, and one thing people keep hammering home to me, it's really tough to tie down these young guys when, one, there's a group of them, like Ranieri, that are all fighting for the same position in the same minutes. Uh, and there's also that kid, those kids like Saka and Martinelli who are quite young ahead of them in the pecking order as well. So it, it, a lot of other teams can offer a more defined pathway to, to regular starting minutes. Yeah, it, it's not one. I it's the one you can see if if he were to move elsewhere in the summer and decide to go somewhere elsewhere. You know, I can see that the club or Mikel Arteta are coming in for some criticism for that. But I also think that's probably going to be quite harsh. I think some it's just very hard to keep these really good young talented players at the moment, such as the competition, such as the offers that they'll be getting from elsewhere, and it's just very very hard to be able to sell them a pathway, especially when you're like Arsenal and like you said, you've got good young players already playing in that role and fighting to get into that position is going to be really, really hard. And, you know, people like Amori will be looking at even Amari Hutchinson. And yes, he struggled a little bit to get in at Chelsea, but he's had a fantastic loan spell away at Ipswich. He'll probably go back there, I imagine, for another year next season in the Premier League, be playing. And Amari will be looking at that and thinking maybe it's best if I do move on. So it's very hard to keep them all. In fact, you can't keep them all. Sometimes players do slip through the net. It's interesting. You've seen the stuff about Ch Chide Obu Martin as well. And, you know, the Lots of clubs looking to lure him away and take advantage of that loophole and getting him a professional contract before he can sign one at 17 for Arsenal. Uh, he's just gone to elite as well. Yeah, and uh, which obviously elite, <laughs> it's not all always bad because, you know, Saka's elite and he's still at the club and has signed a couple of contracts okay, in the last yeah. few years with them but and Arsenal. But, you know, we know the the pathway that elite like to send their players on. And um, yeah, I did, when I saw that he'd signed for them, I did think, oh God. <laughs> And it, it tends to be um, they tend they tend to have have transfer sagas with Arsenal yeah. young players, don't they? they Whether do. they sign or not, it tends to not. You know, I mean, that's their. You know, it's your job if you're an agent to get the best possible deal Absolutely, for your client. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And some of that might well involve establishing interest and offers from elsewhere. But um, mm. yeah, <laughs> uh, it wouldn't wouldn't surprise me to see him to see Cheeto turn up in the Bundesliga or somewhere. No, I one say it, wouldn't, it wouldn't overly surprise me either. And this is the last one here from Pete, and he's talking about potentially selling players this summer. He says, uh, extra time, how many of these players would you sell, agree to move on? And he lists Inketia, Nelson, ESR, Tavares, Ramsdale, Zinchenko, Vieira, Laconga, Tierney, as well as letting Cedric and El Neni go, say 150 million coming in. Thanks for them. <laughs> Personally, I think I'd be happy to see all of the above move on and replace them with four or five top quality first team players. Our second string, all of the above, are just not the right levels. If we replace them with players that will properly compete for the first team, Arteta will be able to rotate more than he has done this year. Who comes in? No idea. That's up to us. Uh, Arteta and Eddie. I trust them both. The only issue here is, you know, I think all of those players could potentially go mm -hmm. this summer, but I'm not, when I say that, I don't mean all of them at once they're in the same group. I mean, if you're selling one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you've got nine potential transfers there as well as two free transfers. That's half of your squad, uh, really, as a first team squad, nearly. It's like, can you really let about that amount of players go at the same time? I think it's much more realistic to think maybe four or five. Of I think Inketia goes. I think Nelson goes. I think mm -hmm. Smith Rowe goes. I think Ramsdale goes. No, you're keeping Nuno. I'm just not sure you're going to sell Nuno, are you? I think Nuno probably goes out on loan again like he does this season, yeah, yeah. aren't you? Um, I thought you were going to keep him around the first team. No, I'm talking about selling players. You know, Tierney is not going to be an easy sell. No. Zinchenko falls into the list of, I think, if a really good offer came in for him, they probably would consider it, especially with Timber coming back now. Um, yeah, big if that, though, isn't it? Yeah. Late 20s now, big money kind of only really fits the best teams. Yeah, I kind of look at, you know, she's been looking at Bayern Munich, things like that. I think that's the sort of team, that if he was to go, it would end up being someone like that. I don't think Vieira goes. I don't think they'll, they'll cut there. Obviously, if someone puts a load of money on the table for Vieira, they'll probably mm. consider it, but I don't think anyone will do that. So I think Vieira sticks around and hopes for a more injury-free season next season. Sambi's an interesting one. Um, Tierney, I mean, it's going to be a struggle to sell Kieran Tierney, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I think this is almost the the thing when we talk about like Vieira and ESR is is intriguing to me. I don't think even though one of them will only be, I don't think both of them will stay, and the other one might only be on the fringes. But oh, I mean, there will be interest in Smith Rowe, especially from the Premier League. There's a lot of clubs yeah. that really admire him. 
But if the, the finances and the deal don't doesn't quite look right, you know, I could be talked into a deal. I think the thing with Vieira is I think that one might be a harder sell and maybe you end up sort of loaning him back to Portugal, give him a chance to get his groove back, be a regular starter and keep ESR around. I don't think that's particularly optimal either. Then Smith Rowe would be down to one year, I think, on his deal as well. Yeah. But, so, but sometimes this is what you have to do. You can't just uh, say, right, you know, these players are up for sale now. They're going, we want rid and they will go. Um, especially because, you know, if we're talking about these players, the market is way ahead and absolutely well aware that Arsenal can't get big money for these players players because most big clubs can't they need to shift the wages mm. um yeah it will be a real challenge and i think like people you mentioned like tierney um maybe even uh and nuno nelson as well potentially it, it might be you take what you get loan you know almost letting them go for very little just to clear out the wages a bit like it's just it's so hard when they're only a few dozen teams in the world that pay the wages you do for a fringe player. Yeah, I would certainly say I am not expecting 150 million to come in for those uh, those players <laughs> that, are li- that are listed there. I have to say, I have to say. Anyway, that's the end of the question. So I think that's the end of uh, that's the end of the show, mate. Thank you very much for joining me. As always, I would say I'll see you at Old Trafford, but I'm not going to see you at Old Trafford. See it, <laughs> no, I am playing golf tomorrow. Oh, lovely so. old job. I know. I'm playing golf tomorrow. Played on Tuesday as well. Two two rounds in a week. Can't beat that, can you? So no, I'm uh, well, I'm, on a, I'm on a golf course tomorrow. But I will. Uh, yeah, I'm sure I'll see you pretty soon. I certainly won't see you at. Um, are you going in the press box for the final day? Yeah, yeah. I've got. Are you not going to come to uh, Spurs Man City? Do anything you can to I help. I won't. I will not even be watching. I will not even be watching Spurs versus Manchester. City. Their their fans will genuinely, genuinely celebrate a Man City goal that day. Absolutely, one hundred percent. You will see celebrations in the Spurs crowd for a Man City goal. One hundred percent. Look, and, uh, mate, I, I don't want to watch it. There's a right. there's a team there with a point to prove. There's not a team there. <laughs> Have you seen them recently? There's absolutely not a team there. There's a there's a Tottenham there, and that's about it. Um, but yeah, all, all hopes on Fulham this weekend. Thanks for joining me, mate. Thank you, everyone, for watching and for listening. As always, I'll be back tomorrow morning for the usual morning show. You want to get involved in that. As usual, get into the comments, fire away some questions to get involved if you want. Until then, have a fantastic Thursday, everyone. James, thanks very much, mate. Catch you soon. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.